Hi, everybody. Um, Joel, compulsive eater um, from uh, currently living in Doylestown, PA, US. Uh, my abstinence date is 31 October 1995. Uh, I weigh and measure three meals a day from the gray sheet, committed to my sponsor. Don't eat anything else, no matter what. And abstinence uh, is the most important thing in my life. Um, I'm a compulsive eater. Um, that's that's what I'm doing here. Um, I'm here n not because it's the easiest, not because it's the simplest. I'm here because it's the only thing that's ever worked for me. Um, I was a fat kid. Just looking at a picture of myself uh, at about one year old or so, and there I am, that pudgy little blonde-haired kid um, who <laughs> throughout his life has struggled with food and, um, and the associated addiction. Um, you know, I have memories of, of course, being the second fattest kid in elementary school. Um, wearing the husky jeans, as they were called at the time. Um, my parents owned a delicatessen, and we would go to the delicatessen on the way to school, and that's where we'd have breakfast, and that's where I would stuff my pockets with various um, sugars that I needed um, to get myself through the day. Um, and I grew up in LA and as you might imagine, it could be, it could get quite hot there. And so it wasn't not uncommon for me to put my hand down in my uh, pocket to pull out a treat and to have it come out all covered in brown stuff that had melted. Um, that went on until the fifth grade and between the fourth and fifth grade, my mother um, couldn't figure out what to do with me. Uh, I went to a doctor and, um, and between the, uh, uh, the fourth and fifth grade, I became a, uh, a speed freak uh, in that a doctor prescribed these little capsules with green and white little things in them that stopped me from eating. And during that summer, I lost a lot of weight and had a normal body and lived a life of a normal person for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, I guess, when school started again. Uh, got invited to parties and played spin the bottle and did all kinds of stuff that kids did. Um, that, of course, stopped when I stopped taking the pills and my compulsive eating got reinvigorated and, um, you know, um, like most of us, I then spent the rest of my life trying to figure out how to be thin. Um, by some miracle, I got um, I found myself in a gray sheet room in Cambridge, Mass, um, in the basement of a church. And at that first meeting, heard people saying the weirdest things that I had never heard of. Don't eat no matter what, and grace of God, and, and, and I mean, I was... Um, a Jewish kid who, um, who whose parents were communists, and so God and churches were the last thing in the world that I'd ever find myself. And then to find myself in the basement of a church and hearing this wild language it just blew my mind. Except that they were talking about food the way I experienced food. And they talked about it in a way that I, I didn't even 
realize um, years of going to meetings and I would hear somebody say something about something they did with food. And I'd be sitting in a meeting and I'd go, God, can you imagine ever doing something like that? And, you know, driving home, I'd say, I used to do that. So I was in such denial around food that even when I heard someone say something, I, you know, it's like, no, that's not me until I had time to reflect. And yeah, sure enough, that was exactly me. That is exactly the kind of stuff that I did. Um, well, by the grace of God and the help of um, fellow grace eaters, I got abstinent and stayed abstinent for a bunch of years. Um, and then went out. I got um, disassociated from meetings and the community. And I went out and ate. And all those years of gray sheet abstinence didn't help. I became as much of a raging lunatic with food as I had ever been. And instead of the little six or seven year old boy with pockets full of melted chocolate, I was the quote unquote adult sneaking into various kitchens in the office where I work, stealing various kinds of food or opening the refrigerator and stealing people's food, whatever looked good. Um, so as they say, this disease just lies in wait for us and doesn't give up. Um, but by the Again, by the grace of God, I found myself back into these rooms. And a day at a time since October 31st, 1995, I've weighed and measured my food without exception. Um, the, the good news is, but, you know, I often hear people say, you know, it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's easy. You want to know something? It's easy. I know what I need to buy. I go to those aisles where I need to buy it. That's what's in my refrigerator. When I want to make a very nice elaborate meal, I can do that. If I need, if I'm called to a meeting and I have to get in the car and go, I can make a lunch and take it away in about 90 seconds. There's nothing easier than, than this. With practice, it becomes second nature, just like anything else that we do. And for people who are struggling, I, I know how difficult it can be. But the good news is, in terms of the physical manifestations of this disease, both on our bodies and our day-to-day -day activities of where the aisles we go down when we go to the market or the convenience stores that we go to or the stops that we make on the way home, all that can become easy with practice. And when I say I practice my abstinence, I do that by weighing and measuring three meals a day off the gray sheet. I do it by knowing what parts of the market I need to go to. It's not even knowing it anymore. It's, that's just where I go. That's, I, those are the aisles where my food is. Um, I don't go to the dog food aisle. I, I don't have a dog. So why would I go to the dog food aisle? I don't eat that stuff. So why would I go to that aisle? I, it, it, it's not even, you know, it's now just a physical habit, just like it's a physical habit that my food is on the counter next to the refrigerator, below the cupboard with my bowl, and the food, the scale comes out, the bowl comes down, things get on there, and they're weighed and measured, and it's done. And what a relief. What that means is that 
all the time that I used to spend obsessing about food and bemoaning everything, um, I now get to spend living. Um, so that's kind of the easy part. Um, th there is a hard part though. And um, if, if I might, I'd like to just read a little bit out of the big book. Um, it, as I said, I kind of grew up uh, or became absent in the Cambridge community. And in the Cambridge community, <laughs> uh, there, there was really no attention to the steps. We became, got it, thank you. Um, we were focused on the food and weighing and measuring. And what I missed was an attention to the steps and other parts of this disease. And I heard someone at the meeting this morning talk about self-centeredness. And um, I've been kind of thinking about that lately. and. In the big book on page 62, it says selfishness dash self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but invariably, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we hit have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. Goes on to say, based on our addiction. And that today we can have a program based on Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, Anonymous based on the steps to replace that self-centeredness to find a way out of that self-centeredness with the help of our higher power. Um, and it's that challenge and work which today um, I'm mindful that I need to do on a daily basis and with the help of you all and the help of the programs of Alcoholics Anonymous um, and the steps, I'm finding a way to work with my self-centeredness. And with that, I'll pass.